we, we are recording the sessions. I'm glad we caught that now before we got into this morning's presentations, unlike yesterday. But uh, almost all of yesterday should be recorded. And with that, I will bring up our opening remarks. Oh, okay. Now, now we can officially start. Yeah. So, welcome everyone back to the Rochester Museum and Science Center and to day two of the AAS Eclipse Planning Workshop. We have a nice crowd here in Rochester. And we have a lovely crowd here online. Uh, welcome back. Feel free to grab your coffee. And uh, for those who haven't met me yet, I am Dan Schneiderman. I am the Eclipse Partnership Coordinator here at the RMSD, the uh, Rochester Museum and Science Center. Uh, for those joining on Zoom, please remember to mute yourself. I'm starting to hear a little feedback. But uh, before we dive into more of the opening remarks, as I know folks have planes to catch, I would like to bring up Loretta to talk about the Yuri's Night Eclipse Uh, what getting ready for the eclipse. So um, if you're interested in, in, in having an eclipse ambassador embed in your community, reach out to me. I'm Loretta, L-O-R-E-T-T-A at yuriesnight.net. Um, and then we'll also our resource for astronauts. So if you want to have an astronaut at your in your city at your event, at your eclipse event, um, we can also help you connect you with the, you know, maybe an astronaut who's from your region or something like that, or uh, someone to be interested in, in being that. So either of those two things, um, contact me. Oh, I clicked on the wrong slideshow. One quick sec. Small tech issue. So, like yesterday, I'd like to start everyone off with a little bit of anxiety. Uh, the one little fun thing about this was updating the slide this morning meant all I had to do was remove one day from each number. Uh, so, uh, both I'm sorry and you're welcome. Uh, like everyone else here, we have these numbers ticking above us. You know, only 357 days away from the annular eclipse and 534 days for the 2024 total solar eclipse. So yet again, welcome to the Rochester Museum and Science Center. I shared some of these slides yesterday, you know, where every wonder awaits. Uh, out of curiosity for those here in person, who here got a chance to explore the museum or enjoy the planetarium or enjoy the after dark event last night? I saw a number of you walking around, tons of fun. I'm so glad that you got the full experience here. Uh, yet again, I should have copied this graphic up individually, but this is where we are here in the path. That dot is us. That is the Strassenburg Planetarium on this map. Or on a much closer view, you can find Rochester almost on the dead center line. If you go about 20 minutes out to SUNY Brockport, you'll be on the dead, dead center. Uh, I want to thank AAS again for coming out to Rochester and to Optimax who sponsored our cocktail hour last night. Uh, I know a number of you had some fantastic discussions with uh, CEO Rick Plimpton about the optics community. And of course, I want to thank all of you. So today, well, yesterday we talked about some of the larger big picture. 
Today, we're really diving into those different audiences. And I wanted to bring this slide I had up yesterday of the Eclipse ecosystem because we are all part of it. Think about your neighbors, think about your family, think about the random stranger near you. And they get to experience a total solar eclipse in either 2023 or 2024. Think about what they may go through and who will have challenges either viewing it or, you know, they might not know about it to the last second. They might have difficulties getting somewhere, difficulties being outside, sensory issues, communication issues, all of that. So as we enter today, I want people to kind of think about this larger ecosystem because there will always be an audience that we haven't thought about. And that's one of those tricky things of, you know, we can dive in, but there's still going to be more and more people that we haven't even thought of or even welcomed here today. And you know, as we look around the room here in person, and as you look around virtually on the participants list, I want you to think about who's not at the table yet. There's always going to be someone who we've missed that we need to reach out to, who we need to work with. Uh, one of my favorite phrases from a former colleague of mine was build with, not for. And that's something I kind of like to carry to heart with every project moving onwards. And, you know, as I will always say, everyone under the sun is a stakeholder. And yes, for some reason, I decided to keep everyone under the moon is too. Are folks, are folks still hearing us? Just want to make sure that we get that. Cool. Uh, for those who want to keep up with Rochester, please visit rochestereclipse2024.org. This photo is from yesterday, so this is one of the few ones I didn't update. And quick housekeeping. Uh, as a reminder, for those here physically in person, the women's bathroom is straight down the hallway. The men's is way down past electricity theater. If you hit the Tesla coils, you still haven't gone far enough. Uh, it's right past those, for which if you do get a chance during your lunch, uh, during one of the breaks during today, I highly recommend shows, uh, attending one of the shows there. Uh, we will be having breakout sessions again. We'll be in the tech lab, which will be straight back. We will be in here, and then we will be in the life sciences room on the first floor and in the Bosch auditorium on the first floor. We will try and help direct people in the right location. Uh, today's schedule, very much like yesterday's, we have a morning plenary. And then a uh, bio break, but unlike yesterday, we will have more breakout sessions. We'll have one immediately at 11. And then the one thing we might give a little leeway in timing is the breakout session after plenary six. We forgot to account for about five, 10 minutes for people to get there and get set up. No worries, we will play with that schedule, especially as we have a coffee break at three to 3.30. <laughs> Uh, for those who are joining us via hybrid, remember to mute your audio. Sometimes you might want to disable your video if you know the feed gets a little iffy. Uh, thankfully, we have a hard wire, so it should be good here. Uh, please put your questions in the chat. We are trying to keep uh, track of all of them as they pop up, uh, just because we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to ask questions, both virtually and here in person. We're trying our best to balance between the two. Uh, if for those who are in person and don't get the chance to ask that question, don't worry, you can still come up and ask the presenters. And with that, I would like to invite our first plenary up. And I believe uh, Janet Ivey will be moderating. So thank you. So, ah, we have amazing and lovely people joining us so if anita you are randy uh allison randy ariana laura thank you oh we need a gonna need an extra chair somehow all right so we got it well, all right you're on it what we'll do here is uh we will go some of you can sit here on the stage and then we'll do like we did yesterday a little bit of musical chairs okay. All right, so thank you guys for being here. Um, it's really fun to be in the midst of people who are like-minded and who want um, all of our communities and our and our world to be science literate and to have fun and know that it's 
one of the most grand adventures we can ever pursue. So it is with my extreme pleasure, we're gonna talk this morning about diverse audiences with diverse needs. So first up, I'm going to invite Anita O'Brien. Anita here is this. She's with Rochester Accessible Adventures. So again, make Anita feel welcome. Thank you. Good morning. It's a uh, great pleasure to be here and talking about this adventure that we're about to have um, on April 8th, 2024, just around the corner as we got the countdown there, a total solar eclipse right outside our window. Very, very cool. By way of introduction, um, Rochester Accessible Adventures has been working diligently to impact our community on the way that we provide um, recreation and sports and tourism to people with disabilities. Um, our unique model actually goes out into those arenas and we teach them how to provide whatever it is that they're doing in an accessible and inclusive manner. It's resulting in some pretty amazing things. The highest benchmark is that people with disabilities and people without disabilities are connecting together in those spaces. So many would think if we just look outside our windows, then isn't that the penultimate of accessibility? The greatest access to any event is just to turn and, and look outside. It does really, really help um, when it comes to this particular event. But I have to ask then why are we spending so much time and money and energy and passion around this three minute event? I think it's because we're curators. We love to facilitate experience and we want everybody to come to our space, our event and experience what we have to show them, which is great. We talked yesterday about uh, bringing them to our hotels, making them eat at our restaurants, buying our merchandise. That's why we get so passionate and the, the energy that we've created around this single event and having them come early and stay late. So it's helpful, I think, to know a few numbers when we're talking about what Dan mentioned, who's not here and who could be here at this particular event. I don't know about everybody's area um, in particular, but we'll use Rochester as a case study just to give you an idea of what numbers you can be looking for in your area. So Rochester's expecting 500,000-ish people to come into our region, as well as the 1.67 million that live around our county. We have about 10.8% of our community that's living with a disability. That's about 82,000 people, just right in here. Um, and that's just folks that are under the age of 65. And they may have intellectual disability, physical disability, developmental disability, children, youth, adults. Nationwide, one in four people, 26% of our population are living with a disability. And we're all members of families and friend groups. And when you send out your flyer and you push that blast through email or social media, it's going to these families. And that means that we want to promote what we're doing to all of these families. Um, that really great visual that Dan had up in the beginning here with all the different dots, that's where we want our social media and our, our email blasts to go, right? Well, here's another number. $490 billion. That's not what I have in my budget for this eclipse. <laughs> that should be nice. But it is the total disposable income for people with disabilities in our country. That's a very large and relatively untapped number, an untapped market for you to be promoting any event anything that you offer. And we have about 18 months to think about how we might target 
this particular market. So you want to get it out to your to all of these families and you want you want a message to go out there, right? What kind of message are you sending? These are examples of what you could be intentionally sending out to the community. These statements are examples of what you might have in your social media blast, on your website, on your newsletters. Very simple statements. Any one of them doesn't take up too much room on your flyer, but it says volumes. It says that you're being intentional about your particular event. My thing is that if you're explicitly inviting everyone in the family, then you're more likely to get the whole family at your event. Because you know what the opposite is? If you don't intentionally invite everyone, the family usually stays home because they don't wanna leave somebody behind. So that's where inclusion and being intentional about it becomes so imperative. So in this brief intro to, uh, to our time today, I won't go into obviously how you do it um, step by step, but we'll talk about it in the breakout later. Um, but think of this, if nothing else, think about a lens of inclusion in your master plan. So yesterday we were given so many incredible links to so many resources about how to bring an Eclipse event into your area. So go through that with your lens of inclusion, whether it's looking at how you're going to accommodate parking. Well, maybe you have two uh, designated parking spaces in your lot. Well, you think two is going to be enough for the day of your event if you're intentionally inviting the whole family? So maybe you erect some uh, once for temporary basis just for that event, right? For, for that parking. Um, you know, we have 18 months to 534 days to, uh, to do this. And that's when you can start being strategic about your restrooms. All of your porta johns, make them the ADA compliant one and start now because that means the business that operates that needs to order a few more, right? You push the demand so that you have what you need. So take those master plans that you've been given, look at all of it through, uh, through this lens, route of access, options for viewing, all of these types of things. <laughs> at a very high level, what we're talking about is something that we all do every day when we go to participate in something. We're looking at how we access it, how we process it while we're there, and what that experience is and how we're influenced by what the program is offering to us. So think of those when you're, when you're designing and planning your um, experience so that with that lens of inclusion, you're looking at access. What does it really mean to physically get there, to, to arrive at, or virtually get there to experience? What about cognitive needs? How do we take instruction? How do we ensure that people know how to use the glasses safely? If you're using a light box, have people been prepared in advance for using those? Um, how do you give your instructions out to people? Understanding what's socially accepted in, in rules and and engagement. These are different ways that people process and think and access. And also sensory. Um, you may be learning, you'll certainly learn more today, that there are different ways that we uh, use our senses to process something like this particular event. So there's, just as there's so many resources around and what an eclipse is and how to uh, develop an event around it, there's also lots of resources around how to make those accessible. So I've listed just one there at the bottom. Um, and then if you wanna dive deeper and really look at your whole entity, um, inclusiverec.org is another great resource for um, learning how you really look at your, your entire organization through a lens of inclusion. I will say that people often think of accessibility from the physical standard. Can they get in the door? Can they get into a, uh, a place, um, can they equitably access it? But I would say about 85% of what we work with when we consult with businesses is around the way it feels. 
that's the kind of inclusion that we talk about is how it feels to be there. Are people represented? Is it really, are they really aware that you intended them to be in that space? And so I would encourage you to not just look at physical accessibility, but look at what you have presented to, uh, to your public um, that are coming to your spaces. Are, are you expecting them? And that speaks volumes for your, for your organization. Lastly, I would say involve your community. If you have planning, how many of you have a planning task group on this? Invite people with disabilities to that table. Use that resource. They're in every community, right? People with disabilities are in every community. So find who they are, find those supportive organizations, intentionally ask them in now 18 months out from the event so that you know that you're not missing things. Inclusion won't do well after you finished your master planning it needs to be now while you're ahead. So this was me and my son in 2017. It's really kind of funny. We're up at Lake Ontario in Rochester, but you'll see our shirts. My mom was in Blairsville, Georgia, and they actually were a little closer to totality. And so she sent me the shirts in anticipation because in that little rural town in, in Georgia, they were doing a really big event. Um, so we celebrate and you see that we were not in totality. It was pretty bright that day. Uh, but there's my resources there, my contact information. Um, I really appreciate you beginning to think about creating your event inclusively and make inclusion happen, not just for this event, but from here on. Thanks. I love all of everything that... Uh... Our Anita had to say it's like inclusion starts now and forevermore. So thank you for that grand reminder. Next up, and Laura, apologies, Pentacolas. Laura yes. is virtual. Right. Oh, there you are. Yeah, here I am. And I hope I uh, named. She's from Sonoma State University. Welcome, and uh, let's hear from you, my dear. Okay, actually, I'm going to swap you swap something up. So um, Ariana and I are presenting together. Thank you. I have you on an iPad right here. <laughs> we have our slides. Yeah, just wanted to get. I can be a small window too. I don't have to be giant. <laughs> Say I have a feeling I need to give quite a few spoilers to what I'll be chatting about and you'll probably be hearing about throughout the day today but that's really exciting that so many of us are thinking about it with such an inclusive brain. Okay, here we are. Okay, so I'm Ariana Riccio. Um, yeah. I work at a nonprofit called Education Development Center um, and I partnered with Laura and our entire team at NASA's Neurodiversity Network. Um, we're funded by NASA's Science Activation Network. I've listed our other personnel here. Uh, Laura, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, my name's um, Laura Petacolis, clearly, um, and I uh, come, I'm sitting in Sonoma County, California, which is just north of San Francisco in the wine country, for those of you who enjoy wine. Um, and we, uh, I, I'm the associate director of a group called Edion STEM Learning Education Throughout the Eons. And we are, um, I'm a co-PI on this um, NASA's Neurodiversity Network grant. I also have been part of um, several other um, NASA-funded and NSF-funded projects to work with a variety of audiences. Um, so uh, that's part of my lens. Okay. Great. I, I left out that I'm not an astronomer and my physics and astronomy knowledge probably goes to high school physics. Is this not working? Um, oh, wow. 
Um, <laughs> great, thanks, sorry. Uh, I'm a psychologist and my work primarily is uh, working with and for autistic young people um, in the high school and college age group, but I've done some work with middle schoolers as well. Um, so we'll be chatting about the goals of N3 um, and how our work comes together with the Snow Estate folks and their lens with astronomy and mine working on inclusion, um, specifically for people on the spectrum. So I'll speak a bit about N3 and what we've done so far, uh, and then Laura will chat about how we're prepping for the eclipse as a program. Um, so we have a multi-pronged approach here, um, but overall, we really want to enable um, participation in NASA science topics and activities by underserved communities, specifically autistic folks and those who are neurodiverse. Um, we'd like to improve scientific literacy for this population by creating authentic NASA experiences. Uh, and we've done this through internships with uh, subject matter experts. Angela actually is one of our uh, mentors for an autistic high school intern. We've also partnered with the New York Hall of Science in Flushing, Queens, and they're our museum partner. So we create programs to um, serve museum audiences. And then we've also partnered with four high schools in the Bay Area, specifically for students with learning differences and those on the spectrum. Okay. So all of the resources we created at N3 are created using a process called participatory co-design. Um, and I'll be chatting about this now and I'll be happy to answer questions about it later. Um, and as Anita mentioned, uh, we really shouldn't be planning events or creating curriculum or programming for people who have any kind of disability, I'll be speaking about autism, um, without those people on our planning teams. Uh, I'm not autistic, and I don't often know what won't, won't be accessible or welcoming or inclusive for someone who is on the spectrum. So I have a few citations here about how autistic people are usually not meaningfully and purposefully involved in creating the programs meant to serve them. Um, so that means starting from the very beginning of that process to make sure that what you're creating all along the way is made with input from your community. Um, so we want to make sure that everything we make at N3, and I hope that you all will take a bit of this back home with you as well, is creating using a participatory approach before it is disseminated widely. So, so far, um, we're entering our third year of N3 in January. So we've completed two um, different topic area kind of redesigns. So the first is called the Astronomy from Home curriculum. Um, and you can check this out online at afh.sonoma.edu. Um, and we had a bunch of uh, curriculum guides for teachers, games and activities online that are totally free for anyone to use. Um, but we gave these to teachers and we tried them out in classrooms. Uh, then we met with those teachers and students to basically have them tell us exactly how we need to redesign all of those things for, um, for a more inclusive experience. Um, so it's, it's pretty fun to meet with high schoolers and have them tell you everything that's wrong with what you built. Um, <laughs> but then you get to make it better. Um, so that's really wonderful. Um, and we, the feedback I've listed here is that uh, students really wanted more of a contextual frame. So we gave them these games about finding exoplanets and brown dwarfs, um, downloading images from GORT, the robotic telescope that's located at Sonoma State University and kind of recoloring them. But we didn't give them like a larger contextual frame about why this is important and what's happening here. Um, and as a non-astronomer, I feel like this could also apply to the eclipse. If we just go outside and, and look at the sky, we don't really understand what's happening or why it's so exciting. Um, so a broader contextual frame to motivate students to really care about the topic areas we were teaching. Um, and something that's been a thread throughout all of our activities is that we need a lot more graphics, diagrams, images, videos, um, and interactive methods for teaching these materials. Um, our second area that we just wrapped up actually is a rocketry curriculum, which was very exciting. Um, Sonoma State actually shipped me a rocket to my apartment in New York City, uh, and I was soldering a payload 
which I didn't know I was should be I shouldn't be allowed to do that. Uh, <laughs> and putting together a rocket, uh, and I couldn't solder anything. Uh, and I was pretty skeptical about how our middle middle school students would do with this at uh, the New York Hall of Science during their rocketry camp. But everyone had a functioning payload, uh, and we launched our rockets. But as you can imagine, it's an incredibly complex curriculum. And our curriculum guide was jam packed with text and diagrams and like trying to follow how to do this. So we need to kind of revamp that visual guide and make it really user friendly um, using checklists and all kind of other um, kind of layout issues that you wouldn't really think about if this is your background area. But if you're putting this in front of high school students or middle school students, we really need to break it down step by step. So I have some photos from the astronomy example. So both of these photos of kiddos are from the New York Hall of Science. Um, and NICE, I actually did a great job doing this themselves before we even consulted our high schoolers and making more hands-on activities. So they have this little handheld telescope with, they did a whole section on lenses and how telescopes work. At the end, one student told me that um, the world is actually upside down and our eyes know how to flip the image. So maybe that lesson on lenses needs some clarification, but... <laughs> And then an image here of students working with um, photos taken from Gort. Um, we have a, a, a clip here that a, a few students in the high school program thought that a discussion of are we alone in the universe would be a really cool way to frame the astronomy for home curriculum. Um, a little conspiracy. Um, okay, and then the rockets, we have some images here of rockets made by our high school students in the Bay Area. They're ready to go. Um, and for soldering, uh, the, the team at Sonoma State sent out these helping hand tools to hold the payload. Um, they were kind of wonky and weird, so nice I ordered these more advanced ones and students had no problem soldering at all. So that's a physical um, accommodation we were able to make. And then here's a checklist of items, kind of breaking down everything you need to do step by step. Um, so I'm likely going over time, but we can talk about this later. I've just listed a few tips for supporting autistic learners here. So providing a visual schedule that breaks down what's going to happen throughout the day. Um, priming students for what's going to come next um, so that they're not kind of surprised by the, your next activity and they have some context for what they'll be doing during that day. Um, embedding interests. Uh, this is never a problem with our N3 program because most of the students who come to us are so intensely interested in space topics. So that's already built in here. Um, establishing clear expectations about what the space is for and how the day will go. And as I mentioned, providing supportive visuals and other reference materials. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Laura to talk about our Eclipse plans. Okay, thank you, Ariana. And I did want to mention, I forgot to say that I'm the, one of the science experts on this team. Uh, I have a PhD in physics, specifically in space physics. So the um, content area is my expertise, not so much the working with the uh, neurodiverse uh, neurodiverse participants, which I do as well, but through, so this, I think here we're trying to model for you, Ariana and I, not only an in-person and virtual hybrid approach, but also <laughs> um, partnership between um, those of us with different expertise. Um, and so I, that's something that I think is really important also for this diversity discussion is to remember to find those who um, have the expertise either working with the audience you want to work with or the science you want to talk about. And then you will um, be able to be more successful in meeting both of those goals. So this is, um, we have a lot of the same uh, goals for the eclipse as you all do. Um, as you heard, the, as with most of us, there's, there's those who love the hands-on um, aspects of learning and really benefit from that. And others who uh, really benefit from the visuals and others who want to be, you know, kind of alone in their room with their computer. Um, so we try to accommodate all of those needs uh, in our curriculum development. Um, the context for this one, of course, is the sun as our, as an active star. Um, and so we will be, for all of you there um, in Rochester who will get the 
amazing experience of a total, total solar eclipse, you'll get to see this active um, corona since it will be during solar maximum. Uh, not all of our participants uh, will be under the path of totality. And so a lot of our activities will also focus on um, shadows and observing the a partial solar eclipse safely. Um, so that will be a lot of the focus for this project, but we will um, have some um, activities under the path of totality as well, as we'll be working with some schools uh, who also will be under the shadow. So that will be great. Um, so you can just see here some of the um, plans. We're developing a, a kind of a cheaper sun spotter than the ones that typically are for sale. So we can get them out to all our classes. Um, also have them build more of it than what, what you generally have for a sunspotter. Um, of course, safe solar viewing in other ways. Um, also, a lot of um, plans for observe safely the sun before the eclipse so that when it comes to the eclipse, um, day of the eclipse, there's not just the sudden learning curve of what, you know, let's look at the sun today, <laughs> but not many, many months before. Uh, so there'll be a lot of that. Also, I would recommend you all, you can take all these eclipse sunglasses are actually sold safe solar glass. So you can go out with those today and look at the sun uh, safely with your eclipse glasses. So I just wanted to mention that and maybe get people practicing using those um, today and for the next 300 and so days, uh, 500 days. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so we, our activities will take place and we will be doing the code um, process with Ariana and their team at EDC. Um, so generally we uh, develop the curriculum or usually use things that NASA has already started with. Um, we tweak them knowing kind of the, for our audience, we test them with our audience. Then there's a co-design process afterwards where um, we really get that in depth um, information. So we'll be doing that again with this curriculum with our California partner schools, uh, the New York Hall of Science, and at least one location under the path of totality. Uh, watch for the activities if you're working with this audience um, on our N3 website, n3.sonoma.edu. Ariana? Yeah, and that's everything. I have our email addresses up here, or you can track me down during the conference today. Uh, thanks for listening. I personally love the um, uh, my folks that are neurodiverse, and I've been working with kids a long time. The most fun comment happened this summer during a camp, and it was a kid age 12, and she was like, I wish school were more like this camp. And I was like, tell me more. Why, why do you say that? And she was like, well, in here, well, at school, you got to memorize stuff and take a test, and they don't really tell you why. Here, we're actually learning how to do something. So for me, I can't be more of an advocate for hands-on activities with kids of any age, but particularly those who look at the world a bit differently with their super awesome powers. So next up, let me welcome Randy Atwood, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Put your hands together for Randy. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, since this is my only chance at the podium, I want to take the opportunity to thank the AAS, Rick and Angela, and Dan and Deborah, uh, amazing Rochester folks for this uh, setting this conference up. It's really been great. So thank you very much. Uh, and since I'm the only speaker from north of the border, I thought I would give you a little bit of background as to what's going on up there. Uh, my background is uh, I was uh, executive director of the Royal Astronomical Society in 2017 and uh, was just as surprised as, as many of the people who are off the path of totality, the, uh, the interest in the event, all of our, we have 30 centers or branches across the country and uh, many of them held uh, outreach programming with local science centers or planetariums or just in local, local parks. And they all saw 10 times more people than they expected. And uh, so it was great to see such, such interest. 
but when I stepped down from the my position as executive director, I took a hard long look at 2024. Uh, because this is the first to total eclipse to go through Canada since 1979, and that was up through uh, Winnipeg and Manitoba in, in winter, kind of a different situation. Uh, so I set up a, uh, a task force, not only to look at what we could do to, uh, to make the experience uh, better for Canadians, uh, but also to, um, uh, to help, uh, to, to partner with various uh, groups in the country because I, I don't like duplication. So I didn't want uh, 10 groups doing the same thing all to, uh, to achieve the, the same uh, result. So I set up a, 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 an RASC Eclipse Task Force and brought on some uh, experts that we have. Uh, many of you know Ralph Chu, Dr. Ralph Chu and Jay Anderson. So they're on the task force. And we started reaching out to uh, organizations like the Canadian Association of Science Centers, the uh, professional astronomy organization, CASCA, and even the, the Space Agency and, uh, and other groups. So uh, there is a, uh, uh, a task force uh, that has been set up in Quebec for the Francophones, which makes, makes perfect sense. And there are other few small task force of, of, of uh, educators um, across the country. But, but there's the path going through Ontario and Quebec. It's passing essentially very, very close to a quarter of the population of the country. And whoever organized this eclipse not to go through downtown Toronto uh, really made a mistake. Because as I, as I mentioned, uh, you know, six to seven million people are going to wake up on that Monday morning and try to figure out how to get to totality. And uh, it's going to be a real mess. But uh, the main goal is to help our centers to, uh, to run programming uh, for this eclipse, uh, uh, for their uh, outreach events, but also to help our, help our staff because uh, uh, we only have three or four people in the office uh, at, the, uh, at the head office uh, in Toronto. And so it's, uh, it's going to be a big drain on our, on our resources. So uh, the things I've learned just in the last uh, day or so have been extremely helpful. When it comes to dealing with diverse audiences and what uh, you know, what the, with diverse needs, uh, I want to tell you uh, an instance that took place during the uh, 2021 annular eclipse. Uh, you may remember that that uh, started north of Lake Superior and the path went up through Ontario and Quebec and into Nunavut. Uh, the uh, some people at the Dunlap Institute of the Astronomy Department of the University of Toronto ran an excellent program for this eclipse. Uh, they used a research grant from the National Research Council of Canada uh, to look at schools along the eclipse path through Northern Ontario and Quebec. And they identified 92 schools, uh, which uh, accounted for about 70,000 70, uh, people and developed solar glasses with instructions in the respective languages along the path. And there were many different languages to, to deal with. Uh, so in the end, they provided 267 kits, solar eclipse viewing kits to 86 communities, uh, which included about 20,000 glasses. So that, uh, that was a real success story. And uh, Julie Bulldog Duval and Dr. Mike Reed at, uh, at the Dunlap Institute uh, need a lot of uh, congratulations for, for that one. Some of the languages that they translated were Inuktitsut, which uh, was spoken, is spoken on Baffin Island, uh, Western Ojibwe, James Bay Cree, and uh, in Oji Cree. So for this eclipse, the goal uh, we have with the diverse groups is to build relationships, form trust, and have conversations to understand uh, these communities' needs. From there, we will uh, develop resources to accommodate these needs. Uh, we're working also to connect with and provide resources with other groups, uh, mainly underserved in lower socioeconomic families and cities. Toronto is a melting pot of many cultures. There is a need to provide educational information about the eclipse in many languages. Uh, I'm looking at local multi-ethnic television, television stations in the city as a starting point. Uh, it's still pretty early for us, believe it or not. Uh, we haven't done a lot. Uh, in this area, but we hope to reach out to these groups to provide the resources that we need. And uh, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, hearing new ways to reach these diverse groups from this session. Thank you.
And last but certainly not least, if everyone will welcome Allison, she's here with the Center for Astrophysics. And is it Yerla? Uh, Berla. Berla. All right, welcome. Thank you. All right, can you hear me okay? Great. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, my name is Allison Barilla. I'm uh, an astronomer at Harvard. Um, and I'd like to talk to you today about a device that we developed for, uh, with the idea of making eclipses more accessible to blind and visually impaired community. Uh, this was in collaboration with uh, Wanda Diaz Merced, the original development of this, who is a blind astronomer. She uses sonification for her research. Um, and Soleil Hyman, who, there she is, uh, to, got involved in this project when she was an undergrad at Harvard, and now she's a graduate student at the University of Arizona. She's done a lot of uh, really great work with the software development and hardware as well. Okay. Okay, I think I got the technology now. Let me explain this technology or try. Um, so it's a very simple device. It's very low cost. Um, if, so um, the idea is we have this very high dynamic range light sensor. So it doesn't saturate in bright light yeah. and it is still uh, makes sound in low light. So the idea is the highest uh, intensity light, the highest, we, we map it to a high pitch. So like a flute sound. And then as the light dims, it goes down to different instruments. So like a clarinet, and then like a low clicking in totality. So um, there's this Flora board, which is the microcontroller. It has the little program on it that basically measures the intensity from the, the light intense, the, the light sensor, and then it maps it to a sound through this MIDI board. So some of you that are musicians might be familiar with MIDI. So it allows us to map different um, instruments to it. Um, and then it can run off a nine volt battery. So you can kind of carry it around in your hand. Um, it also can run off of a computer. So there's a, um, you can plug it in through a USB port um, that can power it, but it also gives you the ability to collect the data. So if you want to use the data later to sonify it or plot it, um, you can do that as well. Um, it has an audio output jack, so you can attach it to headphones or you can attach it to a speaker to make the event uh, accessible to larger groups of people at once. Um, we just got these, um, so I just designed these wonderful 3D cases and uh, Dan made this connection and we were able to get these donated. Um, and so we'll be going forward, we'll be using these 3D printed cases with braille and everything. It really came out nice. Um, so I'd like to just play a sound clip. So I hope the sound is, is up enough, um, but this is just a simulated idea of what it sounds like during an eclipse. So you'll hear the flute when it starts and then as it eclipses, the sound will go down. Let's see if this works. Maybe you can hear the clicking. So obviously, eclipses don't happen that quickly, but this gives you an idea of what to expect over the over the entire night. So, um, so we did this. Thank you. So um, we, we developed this for the 2017 eclipse and it was kind of a proof of concept and it worked and we were very happy with it. Um, so then we got a grant through the International Astronomical Union to build 20 devices um, and distribute them across Chile and Argentina. Um, and we did, and we just got amazing feedback and we were, it was so rewarding. So there's a map of different locations where we had them. And these are two images that are my favorite that came back because um, they really show like the different ways you can use this device. So on, on your right is uh, an individual, a little boy who's blind, holding the device, um, using it for himself. So you can take control and capture your own data and his headphones on. But on the left is, is um, a gigantic stadium, La Portada, La Portada Stadium in La Serena, Chile. And there's thousands of people there. But this group in the front um, has, a, has a table with a light sound on it and it's connected to a speaker. So that group is able to hear the sound while the others are experiencing it visually. Um, it gives, one little device can make this you know, entire event or a subset of the event accessible to those who need it. So uh, 2020, they come back to back here. So we were able to collect those devices, redistribute them. Some groups were having similar events, so they kept their devices. Um, and then we partnered with our Chilean colleagues who got an ESO grant as well to build over a hundred devices. So we're spreading it out and making more, more events. And I should note, 
to make the device, it's about $50 for all the parts. Everything's open source. I should have said that. The code, the instructions are in English and Spanish. Um, the instructions to build it, the instructions to use it, um, the software. So they did some really nice plotting software as well. So everything's on there. Um, but if you don't want to deal with all the circuitry and soldering, which is actually a really great thing, it's a, it's actually a really good teaching tool. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, we are built, we're running these makeathons so we can build devices and then donate them. Um, we want to get them in your hands, the people that are running these events. Um, and we've already donated a bunch here, and we're happy to give them to every single person that needs them. Um, we don't have too many yet, but we have about 50. Um, and we're hoping to make more. That's the goal. Just keep building on this. Um, we should know in the next month if we get another IAU grant to build another 100. Um, so we'll want, we'll want to partner with all of you. There's a scan code, or you can email us if you're not into the QR codes. Um, but we want to build more devices. We want to run more makeathons. And we want to donate the devices. Get the pictures they need. Okay. Um, so this is uh, so we just had an, a workshop here two days ago. Um, thanks to Dan, we had this great partnership. A robotics Club. They came in, built a ton of these devices, and even took some to the local high school. And they're going to build them over the next couple of months and then get them back to us. So that's the image on the left. We did a we did one back in 2020 in the Hawaii workshop right before the pandemic hit. Um, and it was a, a really great workshop. Um, and so we're, we've are we done this a few times. So this is on my last slide. Um, these QR codes take you kind of those instructions, the software, like I said, everything's open source. Um, there's also the, the links and emails. Um, I don't have time to talk about it, but we have two another device. We have a, a color version of this. So, so the light sound is just, intensity. So as the light dims, the sound goes down, but this orchestra device is based on color. So it has a color sensor. So now it's mapped to color. So red light is a lower pitch, blue light's a higher pitch. It even reflects. So you can shine it off your shirt and see if you're wearing a red shirt or a blue shirt and it gives sound based off that. So I'm happy to talk about any of those later. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I am in awe and thank you for that amazing good work. I'm gonna go quickly because I'm sure there are tons of questions and these were just things that we did back in Nashville. So um, everybody has a place in the path. And so figuring that out, one of the things that we wanted to do is that at the time in 2017, there was a very large unhoused community living under the bridge, so much so that they have something called the bridge community. There is, uh, and there are several churches that take lunches, provide services, medical, et cetera, and go out. So we connected with that agency and uh, I'm ahead of myself. So I got talking about that. Uh, let me just go forward and then so these are some of the things that we get back. The National Rescue Mission also works with the unhoused and homeless. And so paper opti American Paper Optics uh, gave National Rescue Mission and its workers uh, glasses to hand out to their unhoused. Some of them can stay at the facility, but only if they mind the rules. So thusly, some people are uh, living in various places around the city. But we engaged in, this was something that came from, I believe, Columbia, South Carolina, and there were some outreach workers handing them out on the street. So again, as we think about inclusion, um, as uh, Anita was talking about, starting to think about everyone in your city and for us it was a, a, it was really lovely and there were many folks from that church group and those people who uh, regularly attended to those folks in the bridge community who stayed with them the whole time talked them through what we made sure to do is that anybody that we reached out to the community they had they had information they had a powerpoint they had something that they could show on their phone they had talking points and they had all of the safety guidelines so that for me was one of the things. But I think as far as the safety message, it's like that has to be true for any community that you are serving is that you really get your safety messaging correct in whichever ways, whether that's putting all of the messaging on the glasses or what you're handing out to folks. Again, that is one 
way that we like to do it. The other way, this, this letter is not showing up at all. It's taken from the Washington Post. I think when I um, put it over to PowerPoint this morning, it didn't transfer. I'm happy to email this to you. It's a lovely letter about how to engage the parents, not only of, you know, children everywhere, but especially children that might have some, you know, particular needs. And this is a lovely, a lovely thing to put inside. And I think I mentioned that one of the things is like Metro Nashville was really iffy on whether there was close the schools, not close the schools. And again, in certain communities in Nashville, we've got one of the largest Kurdish communities, uh, more than it's like pretty much as, as next to Kurdistan. So you have all of, we've got Egyptian, uh, Egyptians and many kind of immigrants there. So we wanted to make sure, how do we, how do we get this? And I did super love this graphic. So four schools that were in particular areas where we knew the population was more diverse. We made sure this went home. We actually also, it's like if people, didn't have a colander, we actually sent them a button. I can't wait for you, please attend Vivian's uh, White's se uh, session on education. She's a genius at the informal thing. And you can have, you know, stand with the button uh, here and the sun behind you, and you can see everything through this button. So it was ways to make sure that everybody had what they needed. And, you know, even through COVID, one of the lessons we learned as we were doing outreach to, uh, via Zoom uh, for Metro Nashville STEM schools, K through five, it's like we could do an activity, but if they don't have the materials, they can't do the activity. So literally myself and a couple of interns were delivering things on people's porches to make sure that they had everything, scissors, tape, everything. And that was kind of my lesson about um, equality and equity. It's like it wasn't just enough to get them the materials. If one day Josue, uh, we were on a Zoom thing and he got very upset, he did not have tape. We managed to put it together with band-aids, but I made sure I found and was able to deliver through the school some tape and an extra thing of band-aids. So, so we encouraged him to use that. But again, that for me has been this process of going real equity, equality, inclusion, do they have everything they need? It's not just enough to open up that space. It's like, we've got to make sure. And so I'm super excited about seeing a lot of the things that are up here today. So this again was made for the 2017, but is available on the AAS website. Uh, another community that often, that again, we sometimes discard is the aging community. And so we had other uh, kind of like people who showed up at our task force and community meetings. It's like, well, what about those at assisted living places or nursing homes? So we garnered some college students from Belmont, Vanderbilt, uh, Lipscomb, and MTSU. We trained them again. So they were going into these places. The these folks loved having this influx of college students come in. And again, we made sure they had the basics. And again, what's great about all the resources that have been named, there, there's a there's a PowerPoint already available to you about explaining what the what an eclipse is. And then they talk to the residents about the safety. And so to be able to take, you know, every, every human, everybody's got a place in the path out there. And it was very rewarding for our um, college of volunteers, they said, you know, I, I volunteer because I needed the volunteer hours or whatever they might need them for, but I had so much fun experience that and feeling like I facilitated part of this event for this community. So don't leave out the grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles that might, might not even have family or have been visited in a while. So something fun to think there. And then Again, school children, if your uh, town, city, you know, district is saying kids are going to be home, again, equipping them. We decided in Nashville that it's like, you know, one pair of glasses they could share and pass around. Uh, again, with we sent directions home um, in a couple of languages uh, and said, you know, if, please don't touch the lenses, those kinds of things. But again, However, and, and we also worried about, it's like if you heard Tyler talk about um, 
his experience, his first experience, he stayed inside because he was afraid that his eyes would be burned uh, in some fashion. So also for those parents who are going to be the workers and at work the day of the eclipse, and if especially I think in Rochester, uh, it's happening around 3 p.m., it's like that might be a time when there aren't grownups necessarily around. So making sure the kids uh, had full awareness and were encouraged to go outside and um, Lastly, uh, going back to um, uh, the visually impaired, NASA has a fantastic resource and it's called Getting a Feel for the Eclipses. There's even a video uh, about that, but you can check it out at lunarscience.art.nasa.gov. And it's a beautiful tactile map where you can, uh, where a person can read it in Braille and get a feel for an eclipse. They send them for free. Yeah, they send them for free. So uh, it's it, it's it's just a great resource of making sure you have a chance to uh, get that. This summer, I had um, I do something in the summertime called Janet's Planet Astronaut Academies, and uh, I was in New Braunfels, Texas, had my first ever visually impaired student, and JT had been blind from birth, and I was like, okay, we can do this. We include everybody, and NASA quickly. Uh, supplied me with Apollo lunar maps and everything. So uh, just reach out and they were incredibly generous to provide. Wanda, uh, the astro blind astrophysicist, as also had a private Zoom session with JT, which was amazing. So um, I probably would add to this thing. This is a Girl Scout troop. Again, we tried to, or best is my best, is if the minute somebody mentioned uh, a community. I was like, oh, do they have glasses? And so that to me is the overarching question here, right? It's like, I think Anita opened this up so well. It's like really, truly through that inclusivity lens, does everybody, does anybody, like who do we need to reach to? Do they have what they need? And so, you know, uh, the Girl Scout troop got glasses and were standing with their troop leader and they made it a day since school was not in session. So please reach out. I know we probably have tons of questions and everything, but you've heard of a varying amount of ways, but um, going back to even what we were talking about yesterday, get loud, get curious, invite, include, ask people what they would need or want. Uh, as someone who's very sensitive to kind of like crowds and noise after a moment, it's like also being sensitive to that. We know that if they're going to come to a lot large event, the crowd may be loud. So creating <clears throat> safe places to get away from the maddening crowd, creating safe places where it isn't as loud and realizing that there are a myriad of sensory overloads that can happen to folks and so accommodating for those as well. But let's, I'm sure we've got questions and uh, will those appear here for me? Uh, well, we got okay, perfect. All right, my time is done. I leave it to these great people. <laughs> I would like to invite all of our panels back up. I'm sure we can get one more chair and if someone's good with you know, hanging out right in front of the podium, we're good there too. Uh, we will be bouncing back and forth between uh, virtual questions and in-person questions. All right, we've got two uh, online questions for Allison. Um, if we wanted to host a makeathon, would you provide the materials to make the devices? Or where can we get a grant to help pay for the devices to be built locally? Um, we were also we were suggesting um, get in touch with a local hardware store, a computer parts store. They likely will give a donation for stuff. But um, if you wanted to address the makeathon question, okay, yeah, um, yes, um, I we Bill and I are happy to do makeathons. Um, we only have so much money, so this makeathon here was um, provided by a grant from the AAF. We get the one uh, for IAU. We will have some funding to do one or two coming up in the spring or summer, but they are expensive. Um, so we do rely on, you know, maybe community donations. I, I don't know a lot of the big grants like NASA and uh kind of passed, but but you know, it's not 
horribly expensive. So maybe we can pull it together Monday. So if you're interested, please contact us and we'll work with you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just to add on to that, I always recommend reaching out to your local maker spaces, both in schools and planetariums and communities. A lot of them do have some resources to help you out. And the follow up question how expensive is expensive? Well, like I said, the parts are about $50 um, to make one uh, if you 3D print the case. Um, and then it's just getting us there. We don't charge anything. We just need to get there. <laughs> if we, if a group felt they had the equipment and the know-how internally, we didn't, do Do you require someone from your group to come and do it? Or is the is the capability, or the lists and everything on the site to be able to, yeah, so folks it, want to do it themselves? We were amazed at how great these robotics students and people are at soldering. So I think, you know, if you have a group like that, they could probably take it, take it upon themselves, um, you know, uh, but we are also happy to, to work with you. So we can definitely talk about it. Uh, one more virtual question. I don't know if you got answered in the chat, but uh, do we know if there's going to be an updated field the Eclipse book being updated uh, for 2024? Yes. 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 So the, the answer is yes. Cool. Wanted to make sure that got addressed. Uh, in person questions. And feel free to introduce yourself for those who uh, can't see the other, can't see the audience. Rick Eames, New Hampshire Solar Eclipse Task Force. This is for Allison. Um, I think I remember back in 2017 that in addition to the light sound device, there was a vibration device. Are you familiar with that at all? And is that still around? The rubble map. The rubble. Oh, the, the eclipse, map. yeah. Yes. So there's, I think there's an app that does that. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That is still around. Right. Got it. Great. Thank you. Yes, Eclipse Soundscape is uh, is still available and is updated for the next Eclipse, so that is coming soon. And the second part for Allison, too, I was just going to ask if you were familiar with the Library Telescope Program? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, so that might be a way. It's libraries that get uh, visual telescopes, but they might be interested in, in adding your light sound device, so I'll talk about that with you later. Thank you. Other in person questions? And we have more from virtual. Um, yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, this is probably a question, I think, for Laura. Um, are there best practices or do you all have advice for engaging with neurodivergent folks during outreach events? and are recruiting this audience as citizen scientists? Well, maybe Ariana can start with um, the events with the outreach, and then I'll talk about citizen scientists. Sure. Um, so N3 doesn't so much plan like big events like I think many of you are planning to host. We're more about sending out curriculum for you to take and do with as you wish. But um, off the top of my head, I've seen museums and other science centers be really um, successful when reaching out to local advocacy groups, generally run by parents. Um, I would I would also reach out to neurodiverse adults in the community as they're often really plugged into the places where um, people find each other and find community within those smaller groups of folks, especially people on the spectrum. Um, I, I have seen a lot of very successful like sensory spaces or just specific days for just autistic people to come to the museum, maybe an hour or two when the museum is closed to the public. Um, and I've heard mixed results about that from autistic self-advocates actually, that it's kind of limiting um, or othering, that they don't feel like they're part of the larger community. So I would consult some people in your local area before you go ahead and do something totally separate. I would think about how you can incorporate them into the event um, or support them in having their own smaller events that might not be as overwhelming, but still welcomes a group of people to come together and experience this as a group. I hope that answers the question. Uh, actually, on those same lines, uh, has anyone here seen at a solar viewing event or a telescope evening or at the, during the last solar eclipse, uh, quiet areas where you can get away for a few minutes or uh, other resources 
for those who need that moment away. And I, I open that question to the crowd as well. Uh, as I know, we've implemented uh, quieter zones within the museum. Uh, and it's been a, we've integrated into a few events as well. I'll add a little bit to that. Um, there are many resources for creating pop-up sensory stations. Um, the inclusiverec.org site that I gave you is one of those. Um, you can get handouts on how how to put those up, um, whether it's a, and Dan, you had mentioned this. I love the idea of just the vendor tent kind of things with the sides on um, where you can limit the number of people that can go in. And then Dan had a great creative idea of how to put the pinhole in the top of the tent so that it actually uh, is viewable on the side of the inside of that tent. So you can limit the crowd. Uh, you can limit sound during that space. Um, and so that experience can be a lot um, more appealing to some people. But then just outside, step outside the tent is, you know, your bass that's also viewing the, um, the sun as it's going through the eclipse. So those are really great examples of even in the midst of a thousand people, you could have pods of space that can be more sensory friendly. And granted, it was August 17th and super hot in Nashville, but we had misting tents, but we also had seating for any elderly or folks who might not be able to walk or stand for very long. So considering that too, to have, you know, just, you know, available seating or places in the shade um, for, um, for some of your folks who may want something like that. Hey, another question. Oh, oh uh, I will let Laura talk about this. Uh, I'll put you on the big screen. <laughs> okay. No, I just wanted to mention the citizen, um, in reference to the citizen science question, um, I think that there is a wonderful opportunity to engage um, neurodiverse and other types of, I mean, really all of us in citizen science activities. Um, as with most people, um, once someone finds that interest in whatever the citizen science activity is, let's say it's observing animals behavior or taking photographs of the corona during totality or um, measuring light values, um, that whatever that activity is that is happening in the citizen science kind of crowdsource data gathering, um, if if someone's interested in that, they're gonna they're really gonna do it well. And so I think just having the supports for um, how to get that information um, to the to the participants in terms of what is needed in terms of collection, whether it's using an app and having those instructions like Ariana was talking about. And I think this goes for universal design too. Um, just very clear steps, step by step, what needs to happen when um, and making and also having a follow-up afterwards. I think as someone who did some citizen science crowdsourcing in 2017, what was very evident is that the participants in our Eclipse Mega Movie project really wanted and needed for us to be available for the following year. And we were for a couple months afterwards. Um, and But I really think there's the, kind of this like someone said earlier, we have these three minutes, but for citizen science projects, we've got at least a year after the event of processing data and engaging our participants. So I think that we'd need to think outside the three minutes and remember that um, these audiences, once we've engaged them, they want to stay involved, especially those under totality, because it's such a life-changing experience. So I just want to... And we've got a great comment from Andy online that I think everyone would, would benefit hearing from. I appreciate the emphasis of involving the communities in the planning. Community needs cannot be assumed uh, by those outside of those communities. And doing so, assuming we know best for others, can in fact cause harm. Needs of communities of people different than ourselves are also diverse and their voice is important. Um, 
and Spencer asks a question. Has anyone seen the tent made of a black polymer where a bunch of kids can look up through the tent and see the crescent of a partial eclipse? Yes, that is from um, Derek. Derek, Derek Pitts Derek, at yeah. the uh, Franklin Institute. So yes, so get in touch with Derek Pitts at the Franklin Institute. He's done all that. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, he's been inspiring a lot of us to work on different devices uh, and what fun shapes we can also play with, either between tents, giant glasses. Uh, here's so many different things that we can play around with. Uh, and I'm sure we can look up, uh, I think it's on the Flickr account, uh, an image of this, and we'll try and throw this up on the big screen. Uh, any other questions as we're looking for that here in the audience? Okay. Hi, I'm Kim Reeves from NOAA. Um, so I'm sitting here and I'm as we need to engage members of our community and include them in our planning and our task force. How how do I find these people? For us, Kim, it was just get loud and find out. It's like there were there were people who were attending our kind of planning committees or our monthly community meetings. And it, then you would just be in conversation and all of a sudden you go, oh, I haven't thought about, yeah, what, what are we gonna do about that? So I think for us anyway, and what I might encourage is just continually talk and ask and go, or is there anybody, keep brainstorming, is there anybody we're not thinking about? And it was be, it was because of somebody who was regularly doing outreach with the unhoused community that that whole comment came up that we didn't, you know, sad to say that might not have been one of the things on my list, but I don't know if you, have, you guys have ideas. Well, I was just gonna say just planning for accessibility. Accessibility does not just benefit people that need accessibility. Accessibility generally benefits people, right? Like sometimes you want to take a ramp because you're tired. You don't want to go up steps, right? You, you're you're carting, um, carting things around and you, you roll it. You don't have to carry it. Um, with the lights on in particular, people are excited about sound. Like we had, we had a demo last night. People were coming through playing with tactiles and listening to sound. And it's not just for those who are blind and need it necessarily. You know, kids get excited, adults get excited. It's just a different way to approach things and a different view. Some people, in, you know, benefit from sound more than light, right? Like you might not be a visual learner. There's all kinds of ways, but some of these things are very simple fixes and um, you can do it ahead of time and, and it benefits like a large group of people. And I think knowing that there are people, with, specifically people with disabilities in every community, um, and you can be very, specific about how you and intentional how you find them. Um, so if you go to a school system, the school district has most likely at least one child with a disability. So that will immediately connect you to uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists who are probably have a client caseload of families that have a person living with a disability. Those are great people to pull in, professions to pull into this um, for outreach. And, and also participation. And another thought on people with disabilities is they could be your next scientist. So when you're thinking of providing what you're doing um, in this more diverse way and inclusive way, you're looking at potential students, you're looking at potential employees, um, and your potential professionals that are gonna make the next great discovery. So that might turn thinking upside down uh, for some folks that maybe see that group, that target group as someone to give something to, but I would encourage you to think of what you will gain from that experience. And I know here in Rochester, Dan and I, Dan's been doing a lot, um, and one of my roles on the stakeholder group is to find populations to bring in. And some of those initial conversations have brought me directly to um, to individuals that have already been studying space at home in their own way, that have just been invited to this stakeholder group. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking that's gonna open up a lot of those doors by having someone internally reach out to others around. So a couple, couple of thoughts on that. So I just want to add a little something. 
Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Angela Speck. Most of you have met me already. <laughs> sorry, people online, most of you have met me already. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I just wanted to add that the, the AAS has a working group on accessibility and disability. And so there's actually a group of people within the astronomy community who are thinking about these issues and are thinking about how we um, help people with disabilities, accessibility issues, and, and disability is defined very broadly um, to be successful as astronomers. And so it's about bringing them into, you know, not just bring them in, but allowing them to continue to be successful as astronomers. But that means we have a group within astronomy that can help us with connecting to those resources. Uh, while I have this up and I'll share it in the screen, I think it just got shared in the chat as well. We were able to track down Derek's photos. Uh, several of us have the photos pretty quickly uh, for one reason or another. I know a lot of us have been looking into it, but here you can kind of see a few of the attempts with the fabric just kind of uh, draped over the tents. And then to give you an idea underneath, you can see people looking up. So this is something else that you can play with. Uh, other questions, either virtually or in person. Yes. Just want to share the resource for that material is Thousand Oaks. Uh, and I believe we have that in the chat. Yep. Other questions? Check in the chat. Do our, do our panelists have questions for each other? <laughs> Can I get your card? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Can I have a clarification on that? Yeah. I didn't quite understand. Uh, underneath the tent, uh, are, are they projecting down onto a flat material nope. inside underneath the tent? No. What what no. are they projecting onto? They're, so for Derek's tent, they're literally just underneath sheets of this black silver black polymer bulk solar film, and they just go underneath and look up, and there's the image. So they're not projecting an image, they're just looking through a large sheet of the film to see a, a small image of, the, uh, to see the sun directly. And then you can take a picture of whatever you see. The only, the only difficult thing being that you also will see a very nice mirrored reflection of yourself because the solar film has a reflective side. So that's the only part that people have to get used to is actually finding the sun because it's going to be remarkably small. Uh, Let me just add that if you do build such a tent, the silver side faces the sun. So it shouldn't be the other way around. Right. This side up. <laughs> uh, we'll have Laura give another comment. Yeah, it just I know there's a lot of questions about how do we how do we reach out to audiences we might not be reaching out to. And um I just want to remind everyone that cold calls to organizations run by the audience we're trying to reach work. So, you know, a lot a lot of us are very shy, but we um have to get over that and make those calls. It's a simple thing. It can be to churches in the area. Um, just, I mean, there's so many organizations, community organizations in all of our backyards. And it's just a matter of picking up the phone and introducing ourselves and explaining what's happening. And, you know, most people will be really interested. Some might just hang up on, on you, but that's okay too. <laughs> most will, will wanna know more. Uh, on a similar note, and this goes for you know partnerships overall, uh, I have found that if uh, an organization has a semi-active Twitter account, uh, private messaging them uh, has actually worked wonders. And I know we've been able to get some of our graphics updated uh, for the, the museum for our videos. That way we've been able to reach out to new partnerships. Uh, it is uh, incredibly effective, uh, both that, direct messaging through Instagram, all of that. 
And Andy has another suggestion to find those organizations and coalitions. You can Google your location name followed by the audience you want to work with. That's it. Use the position. <laughs> Uh, yes. Hi, it's Kate Russo being in the shadow. Hi, Dan. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that when I, I did a number of uh, events at senior centres across the path of totality in, leading up to 2017, and that was really fun to do because I remember this one lady, she said to me, oh, I'm on so many drugs now that I'm not sure that I'll enjoy this. <laughs> And then she said, but, you know, the last eclipse, I was on a lot of other different drugs too. <laughs> so they really surprised you with some of their comments. <laughs> um, but that's really fun to do. And senior centres are always looking for people who come in and give their time and um, spend their energy. And it's it's just so rewarding. So I highly encourage you not to do that. Uh, actually, kind of on a similar note, I also recommend reaching out to your hospitals and thinking about all, uh, all of the people who might be in the hospital during the time of the eclipse. Uh, I know here in Rochester, we're in conversations with the uh, Valisano Children's Hospital, especially, but, you know, just making sure that the materials are available to them there as well. Uh, you may not know who will be there at that time, but you should try and plan to make it as accessible as possible. Any last questions either virtually or in person? Uh, if not, we are on schedule for our bio break for the next half hour. Uh, we will be back at 11 o'clock for our breakout discussion sessions. And in about maybe 10, 15 minutes, we will make sure everyone here physically uh, knows where to go. So we will work with you to get that all cleared up. Thank you. And we'll see you at our. Yeah, I do. I can yeah. I don't think I gave you. Did I give you glasses? I think I gave you. Glasses. Yes, right. So this is what I like to give you. I'm looking for six.